Heck, I can project. Okay. There we go. Good afternoon and welcome back to the 2023 annual meeting of the Mississippi Historical Society. And um, before we move to our panel, I would like to take this opportunity to recognize our sponsors for this year's annual meeting. Those are printed on the back of your program. Uh, of course, the Mississippi, Dep Mississippi Department of Archives and History, we must recognize them. The Bank of Anguilla, Dr. Alfredine Harrison, Mr. Elbert Hill Hilliard, who we will see tomorrow at the luncheon, and also myself. So thank you to all of our sponsors for this event. And we are fortunate to start off our first session for this year's meeting. And of course, this session is going to feature a wonderful panel of individuals from Jackson State University. And it's entitled Jackson State University and the HBCU History and Culture Access Consortium. And it is going to be moderated by Garrett Lee of the Margaret Walker Center at Jackson State University. So let's please welcome this group. All right, hello everyone. Thank you, Daphne, for that introduction. All right, so um, we are going to talk about today in kind of a roundtable discussion kind of style, uh, the work we're doing with the Smithsonian um, Institute. Um, am I doing that? Is that coming for me? Um, so um, we're going to, first I'm gonna kind of introduce who we are and talk about uh, what we do and then introduce the program and then introduce our panelists and then have everyone talk about one specific collection that we've been working on as part of this project. So um, we're from the Margaret Walker Center on the campus of Jackson State University. For those of you who don't know what that is, um, it was founded in 1968 as the Institute for the Study of the History, Life, and Culture of Black People by Margaret Walker. Um, today, we're known as the Margaret Walker Center. We're an archive, museum, Black Studies Institute. Um, in our mission statement, and I'll just kind of read from it, we're dedicated to the preservation, interpretation, and dissemination of African American history and culture for a local and global community of students, scholars, and the supporting public. So basically, we are an archive and museum and Black Studies Institute, and we are here to preserve culture, preserve the history, and get it out there into the public. Now that brings us to the kind of the second thing here, which is the HCAC, the History Culture Access Consortium. This was started back in 2021 by the Smithsonian and the National Museum of African American History and Culture. So what it is, it's a consortium of five HBCUs. Um, so it's us, Clark Atlanta, Florida A&M, Texas Southern, and Tuskegee. And so what we're doing is we're working initially on a five-year project to digitize as much of our archives as we can, create a forward-facing, public-facing website, and also a traveling exhibit that will go all over the country to different museums, as well as um, a, a whole uh, catalog of our archives and stuff that will be shared with an international audience. So the whole idea here is when you, you think about HBCUs in general and our archives and museum spaces, and we're, you know, a lot of our archives are manuscript collections and oral histories and some artifacts and things like that. Some of these other schools, um, like Clark, for example, are mainly art museums. And so they have art, and uh, Texas Southern has big murals that they're doing on top of oral histories and things like that. So it's a wide array of things. And in, in the world of HBCUs, we often find that our um, resources are somewhat limited compared to other types of schools. And this is a program to inject um, resources into being able to allow us to get our stuff out there to a wider audience. And so we we do that in several ways, like we said, the digitization uh, piece of it, um, the traveling exhibit piece of it, but also, and I'll get to this in a minute when I finally introduce everyone, it also creates several jobs um, within this program. So not only my position, the Digital Humanities Program Manager, but also undergrad interns and graduate fellows that we have each semester to create that experience, which is kind of like the next piece of the resources being put in, because if you want to have a job in public history, you often need degrees and experience and things like that, and it creates that experience. And so we have uh, this whole program, if you take the five schools and the several jobs, we're talking about uh, over the course of five years, 20 well-paid jobs a year across the spectrum of these um, universities across these HBCUs. Um, so uh, everyone in that is represented up here um, and we will uh, definitely, I'll introduce everyone here in a second. So that's who we are, that's the project that we're working on, that's kind of the umbrella or wide view of it. We're going to 
focus in today on one specific collection out of our archives that we're working on and kind of walk through the process of how we've done that over the last year. So um, I started, uh, we really got the program started in January of last year, um, and it connects to other digitization projects that we've done um, over the years, uh, but we're going to talk about one specific thing when we get there. Also, because we are super grant funded by all kinds of things, I do want to shout out our other uh, partners in this. Of course, I mentioned the Smithsonian and what I call the Big Museum in DC, but also the Council on Library and Information Resources, National Endowment for the Humanities, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, uh, the Mellon Foundation, which actually funds um, our oral historian in our center and a couple of the um, grad assistants we have up here today who work with this or work on this with us, um, and uh, George Mason University's Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media, who is handling uh, the, the creation of the website for all of this. So it's a big team effort that stretches all across these things. You see a lot of funding and resources coming in um, through all these different uh, folks. We always got to shout them out to make sure that the resources and funding keeps coming this way. Okay, so um, we are, like I said, we're going to do a somewhat of a roundtable discussion here, kind of informal. Um, we've been working on this sp specific collection for over a year now, and everyone up here has had uh, their hands on it in some way and so that'll make more sense as we get there in a second um, we're going to talk about well we'll get to that so let me go ahead and introduce everyone so um, right here to my right uh, is Miss Angela Stewart uh, she's yeah um, she's the archivist um, at the Margaret Walker Center um, of, you know, of course, a lot of you know her. Um, she worked for 12 years as an archivist museum curator at the Piney Woods School. Um, she has her Master's of Arts in Public History from Kent State University and a Bachelor of Arts in History from Alcorn State University. Um, she received additional training from the National Archives and Records Administration in Washington, D.C. Um, at the Modern Archives Institute. And she also served as summer intern at the National Museum of American History, a Smithsonian institution. Um, she served as um, interim project manager for the Mississippi Department of Archives and Histories, Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, where we are, um, and she has co-written articles on Margaret Walker all over the place. Um, currently, um, amongst many other things she does, she serves as the Vice President of Women for Progress and helps plan the organization's um, annual Kwanzaa celebration. She is also the founder and facilitator of the Sankofa Reading Group, um, an auxiliary of Women for Pro uh, Progress, and she also hosts a monthly podcast, History Matters, for the Women of Progress radio network. So everybody give it up one more time for uh, Miss Angela Stewart. You're so popular. <laughs> um, all right, so to her right, we're just going to kind of move down the table here. Um, this is uh, Choma Ajanama. Um, she's a first year graduate student working towards her MA in history at Jackson State. Um, she's also the interim graduate hall director in student housing. Um, her thesis research focuses on how Mississippi shapes female African American literary, uh, literary, wor literary works. Sorry. She also got her uh, BA in political science um, from Jackson State, and she is our graduate fellow with the Smithsonian HCAC project. I will say about Choma, she started as an undergrad intern in the uh, spring semester of 2022 and decided coming out of political science she wanted to major in history because of the work she was doing and moved um, over to be our graduate fellow. So Chioma's been with us um, over a year now. So you guys give it up uh, for Chioma. All right, so to her right, that's Jeremy McDuffie. Um, he's a graduate student um, at Jackson State in the English department with a concentration in creative writing. Um, he considers himself to be a speculative writer with who, in, uh, who embeds elements of the black diaspora in his work. Um, and he's a graduate assistant with us through uh, funding from the Mellon Foundation. So everybody give it up for Jeremy. Um, next is uh, Carolyn Ruto. She's a graduate, uh, or graduate student at Jackson State in Computer Sciences Department. We're a very um, multi-faceted group here. Um, and she's also a grad assistant through funding um, from the Mellon Foundation as well. So Caroline. <laughs> And then Jalen McDaniels, um, he's an undergrad student in the business department um, at Jackson State, and he is our undergraduate intern as part of the HCAC program. I will say another thing about Jalen, Jalen started around, or a little bit after Chioma started, just coming in as an undergrad student doing his service learning hours, and when it was coming time to start a new graduate, our undergraduate intern in the fall, we offered him the position of undergraduate intern, and he accepted, so he's been with us for a minute. Um, as well. So everybody give it up for Jalen. Um, 
And I'm uh, Garrett Lee. Um, as I said, I'm the Digital Humanities Program Manager at Margaret Walker Center. Um, actually worked as a grad assistant myself at the Margaret Walker Center from 2010 to 11 uh, when I was doing my history uh, master's there. I uh, left to be a college professor for a while, got sick of the bureaucracy and came back when this position um, opened up. Um, and I will say for those of you who keep up with the goings on at Jackson State, I am one of the only people and the only person I've ever met who holds degrees from both Jackson State and the University of Colorado at Boulder. So if you've been keeping up with uh, football stuff at all, that might make a little sense to you. So yeah, I did a, um, a BA um, in Ethnic Studies at the University of Colorado and my master's at Jackson State. So um, that's all of us. All right. So um, what we're going to do, like I said, is talk through a specific collection that we've been working on um, from the very beginnings of the collection coming to us, which Ms. Stewart will talk about, um, and then we will uh, go from there and talk about the work and how we've started from one place and ended it up completely digitized, completely organized, and ready for the public to see, at least in our archives, and soon enough for the public to see um, through our website. So um, who we're talking about uh, today is a man named William Lampson. Um, he was an architect and a demographer, and he worked on court cases as an expert witness, usually um, through the ACLU and the NAACP. And his collection um, consists of maps and all these court documents. He worked on over 20 cases. So I'm going to have Ms. Stewart talk um, about the William, Lam William Lampson collection, and then we're going to hone it down a little bit uh, more detailed and talk about the specific sub-collection within that that we're doing for this project. So I'm hand it off to you, Ms. Stewart. Thank you, Garrett. Um, in 2010, Karen Quay, who was the widow of Bill Lampson, and Bill's daughter, Lee Lampson Quay, donated to the Margaret Walker Center what we now know are over 900 maps and 60 linear feet of information from William Lampson's work as a demographer, a cartographer, an expert witness and an organizer of factual research for organizations such as the ACLU, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the United States Department of Justice, and other private clients. Now, you have to understand I'm what's known in archivist circles, and a shout out to my Society of Mississippi Archivist board members as a lone arranger. So for a long time, my main concern with the maps was having them safely stored. They're huge in there, and they're not a one-person job. But we did, um, did um, my mind is giving me, we did process the 60 linear feet of supporting material, which includes documents such as briefs, such as he also did a detailed analysis of population growth and changes in the school district in Topeka, Kansas. And the case we're featuring at, from his collection is the Topeka, Kansas case. But so after receiving the collection in 2010, with the help of Corey Schneider, who at that time was my graduate assistant, he was actually at the center at the same time as Garrett was as a graduate assistant, we did get the bulk of the papers processed. The maps for a long time were just stored, and it has been an awesome thing, the CLEAR grant, the HCAC grant, which has allowed Garrett and these wonderful students, as well as Lauren Warren, who's not here, to come through and organize and digitize the maps. And Garrett, was that what you wanted for this part? That was great, of course, yeah. <laughs> So uh, Ms. Stewart mentioned the Topeka case. And so the Topeka case is also known as Brown versus Board of Education III. Um, for those of you that don't know, Brown was litigated a couple more times um, after you know, 1954. So, uh, uh, William Lamson worked on that case, and basically, just a little background on the case, it was reopened in 1978 over the issue of open enrollment, um, and it had, a, it, and it led to, and, and, or the idea was that it had led to and would lead to further segregation in Kansas schools. So Lamson began work on the case in 1982, and in 1989, a three-judge panel found that vestiges of segregation remain in Topeka schools, and in 1994, new elementary schools were opened, and districts were redrawn in 1998 and met, that met the court standards for balance in public schools. So the collection of the Topeka collection 
as she said, I think the final count of the overall collection of lamps and maps was 944. And we're talking the majority of them being like three foot by four feet that he would like use in court cases that he would literally have um, there, you know, the picture all like uh, court shows like banging on the map with a stick or whatever. Um, but there are uh, most of them are where he's ooh, where he's colored in neighborhoods or put uh, stickies to, you know, show uh, neighborhood changes over the course of decades or whatever. Um, the Topeka, it's the case itself is 113 maps. And I only know this since we digitize it all and I could actually do a page count 12,135 pages of court documents. And as Ms. Stewart mentioned, uh, that's big, thick folders full of briefs, reports, but also handwritten stuff of Lamson. So think in the early 90s when he started this, we're talking like handwritten spreadsheets, like on yellow legal pads and stuff. So the way that we digitize these things is with the maps, we used a third party. Um, part of our clear grant uh, money that's through the HCAC allowed us some funds to outsource some of that. The documents themselves, um, we digitized all in-house. Luckily, we have a really great um, document feed scanner that we'll talk more about with the students here in a second. Um, but we did all of that in-house. And so as we scan and just a couple weeks ago, we got all of our work back from the third party um, company that we uh, uh, farmed that out to. So everything is digitized at this point. So that's where we've ended. Now, as Ms. Stewart said, um, being an archivist, um, the number one concern is storing the maps safely, right? And it is not a one person job at all to go through these maps. They're all rolled up. They're not necessarily, um, you know, gathered by um, case or, you know, city or things like that. So um, the first person to work on those maps uh, was Chioma, um, who at the time was our undergrad intern. And there was another undergrad intern with her named uh, Lauren Warren, who graduated and went on somewhere else um, when she finished with us at Jackson State. So my first thing with uh, Chioma and Lauren is I took them down to the vault and I said, look at all these maps. And they were like, cool, a bunch of maps. And I said, you guys are going to go through every one of these maps and you're going to, I didn't say, I, I didn't know, like, demanded of them. I was like, hey, this is going to be great if you guys want to do this. So um, what it, the idea was is we needed to number the maps and we needed to get metadata for them. So we needed to get all the information about the maps that exist within each individual map. So um, I'm going to kick it off to Chioma right now um, to tell you about where we started with just a pile full of rolled up maps that weren't really documented anywhere. Chioma, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, um, it's really just like Dr. Lee said, there were a pile of maps um, in the vault and it's really not a one person job because the maps are as big as one of these tables and they're really in fragile condition. So when me and Lauren first walked down to the vault, the first, well we just, we just jumped right into it basically. So we picked up a roll and we just started unrolling them and the equipment we had was a tape measure, pencil, and then you know some books to hold down the map so they wouldn't roll back up because they've been rolled up for years. So um, and with doing that we unrolled the maps, um, we collected the metadata and that was basically we had an Excel spreadsheet with all the information that we wanted to collect such as the conditions of the maps, if they were um, in fair or fragile condition, most of them are pretty fragile because there are these paper thin maps that's been rolled up. So, you know, um, even with just unrolling them, and as Garrett said, they have sticky notes, um, cutouts. So with that, it makes the condition a bit more fragile. So being very careful with this, and as, as it was stated, I come from a political science background, so I was really scared touching these maps. I didn't want to mess anything up. But we got through over 900 maps. Um, we would roll them out, get the tape measurer, we would get the length and by width. We would put that in the um, Excel spreadsheet. We would collect the data on um, what city the map was about. Um, the we would get the county what year and that was a bit difficult because some of these maps as they're they're a bit old so the year was really faded out we would have to um we would have to do some research thanks to miss stewart we would have to kind of um collaborate with the court documents and we will see okay this is um from arizona let's see what court document was also in Arizona, and we would just come um, put the cities together that, that way. So uh, really uh, shout out to Ms. Stewart for that. It really made our jobs easier. But in the beginning, we were just really unrolling these maps, um, collecting those me that metadata, which was the size of the maps, condition, and well, um, what the exact city was or the date. 
And then we were numbering the maps with a pencil. So at the back of these um, these maps, we would flip it over and we would say, this is map one. And we did from map one to map 944. And um, that's that was our daily that was our daily project and it never got boring because i was always amazed like it never got boring people like he would ask me like are you tired of the maps yet and i never got tired because it was just um seeing a piece of history really um unrolling these maps seeing who he worked with the aclu and naacp and seeing the work that he actually put in on these maps because he didn't have powerpoint he didn't have like the technology we had so literally the amount of research that he put in to collect census records um, and to co keep everything organized. It was very organized. Um, even though the maps weren't, um, they didn't have an indication of what city or court case, there were multiple maps, let's say 30, they were all rolled together. So if we know one map was Arizona, usually the rest of the maps in those rows were Arizona. So it was some sort of organization, so we weren't thrown directly to the wolves. But, um, but in the beginning, that was really just it, just collecting that metadata um, and just getting those maps numbered so we know it will make it, it, will make it easier on us also. So on the, our Excel spreadsheet, when we see the map number 37, we wouldn't even have to unroll it because as we said, these maps are huge. So we can look at map 37, go to our Excel spreadsheet and see, okay, this is a map from California and have all that information collected there. So in the beginning, that's what me and Lauren was really tasked with to make it easier on the rest of the staff when they came in for the next stage. Awesome, um, and I will say we've used that number 943, 944. We kept hitting numbers where we were like, all right, round 600, we're done. And then these maps just seemed to keep like falling out of the yeah. ceiling <laughs> in the archive. Um, and then we'd, we'd get, we'd hit 700 and 800. And Choma, you know, she, uh, as she mentioned, I asked her if she was getting tired of the maps. She never did, but I would, every time I, she'd show up on a Monday morning or whatever, I'd be like, yo, we found more maps on Friday. And I was just like, kind of, it's like, but she always stuck with it. And we finally would, I would just say, as we got down to the end, um, what we started finding was folders with smaller maps maps in them so it was just like it just kept getting smaller and we but we're done we finally got them all done um, yeah. but it was just interesting to see it work its way down and uh, when she left for the summer and then came back in the fall um, I was like we had set her up a little office and everything and I uh, put uh, just another stack of folders and I, when, I, when she walked in I was like hey welcome back I'm from summer check it out um, yeah. and so that's all right so as she said they got to the got us to the point where the maps were numbered and we have a metadata spreadsheet with all the information on it. Uh, now, around this, as she's doing that, Jalen comes in, and as I said, he was working as doing his student learning, service learning hours or whatever as an undergrad before he became our um, undergrad intern. Um, and so he came in, and I had another task for him because not only was this not a one person job, this was not a one like function job either. So it wasn't as easy as just numbering the maps, getting them on the spreadsheet, and being done with it. We had to continually cross check things and cross reference things to make sure that when we got to the final place we wanted to be at, that they were completely um, organized. So Jalen kind of comes in next, and Jalen and uh, then Shoma and Jeremy were working together. So um, Jalen, uh, tell them a little bit about what you did when you when you came in first with the maps. Uh, thank you. Uh, briefly, as he said, I came in around spring 22, and my immediate job as I came in well, it wasn't really a job; it was community service. So I came there to get community service hours, and immediately I was taken to the vault. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds so ominous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but once I got there, I see about four giant boxes filled with these giant rolls of maps with their numbers. And he takes me, he shows me the Excel spreadsheet. And my job was basically cross-reference the maps and the data to make sure they lined up, to make sure that all the organization was correct. And I say out of those, what, 944, I only wrote about 10 errors, hmm. probably. So it was really good work being done. And as Chioma said, as I did the work, it really became apparent to me the importance of the work that I was doing from a level of the history being there and also a level of the history being preserved. So that always stuck out to me and it always enriched the experience for me. So I say I was in the, the center for about three days a week yeah, during mm -hmm. the spring and I continued during the summer as well because the work was just so filling to me 
and it was work that I hadn't done before. And I also wasn't expecting to get that much of an experience out of it. Yeah, and so um, and that just warms my historian heart for sure to hear that. Um, so uh, Jalen, a uh, little bit more. Um, we talked earlier today, and we have been talking about, and we I kind of we both kind of forgot this until we talked today. Not only did you do that, and since he worked over the summer, he was able to get it set up for uh, Chioma coming back in the fall as the grad fellow, and eventually he didn't know it at the time, but himself as the undergrad intern. So really got a lot of work done through the summer to set us up uh, moving forward last fall. But also um, we needed to create as we're doing all of this, we have to be thinking in the back of our uh, minds finding aids for all of this, right? because you got to be able to find this stuff. So I created a Google Doc um, with all 20 whatever cases listed. And I told uh, Jalen, I was like, as you go through um, and you know, double check and cross reference all of this, I want you to copy and paste. We made the identifiers with our the, the name of the project and dot numbers, numbers, dot numbers, numbers and stuff. So you most of you probably know what that looks like. So he started creating the rough draft of the finding aids. So um, copying and pasting was his friend for sure, especially during the summer. So um, just wanted to throw that in there um, as well uh, as part of this process. So. By this point, where we're at is the maps have been numbered, we've got the metadata, they've been cross-referenced, we're pretty confident in what we have on the maps matches what we have in the spreadsheets. All right, so, um, but we're not done yet. There's still a lot of organization to do. So this is where Jalen Chioma and Jeremy, who comes in as a grad assistant um, last fall, um, first thing I do um, in Jalen and Chioma style is I walk him to the vault and I say, we have all this work down here to do. Um, and Jeremy didn't spend too much time down there, um, but he did, that was kind of like his introduction uh, to the work. So Jeremy, talk about some of your early experiences uh, with working with the maps, please. So, uh so um, when Dr. Dr. Lee introduced me to the archives, of course, and introduced us to all the maps, can you remember? Yeah, okay, better, yeah. and that's, that's better. So, so when um, Dr. Lee took, us to the, um, took me to the archives and introduced me to all of the maps and whatnot, um, he introduced me to Shoma, um, and Shoma um, actually had a procedure done. Thankfully, like all of the metadata and all the stuff was placed in front of me, so it was like uh, it was an easy process. Understanding like um, linking the maps together, um, categorizing them by um, the law, um, by the particular um, case number and the particular location. Um, like um, Shoma walked me like step by step on how to roll the maps up, um, put the tags on them, put the county, the county, the state, and the case number on them, and then place them safely back into the um, in the boxes. Um, like like Jalen and like Shoma said, you know, um, like actually taking a part and actually organizing history is important. But I also would like to take the note of like understanding like the bonding over the maps, you know, the conversations that all of us had when we were like actually working together to get these things done. You know, you know, work is work, of course, but at the same time, like developing these relationships over history and disgusting history is also important. Like understanding that there were multiple like intersections of like Brown versus education, which was also interesting to me as a writer because I take part in like trying to write history and for people to understand history. So like rolling them out, putting them in there, we got that completed within about, I think about like two, about two, three weeks um, when I started working there. And that's about it. <laughs> Jay, uh, Chama, go ahead, yeah. And I will say, um, it's definitely a bond because when you're in the vault, like it's cold, it's cold down there. <laughs> so you know, we have to bundle it up, and it's an exact, and it's a science. You wouldn't think about it, but like literally rolling the maps, the way you roll the maps to store them the best way. Um, we got some more equipment. We got, um, we had some thread and a and a punch, um, a punch hole. Hole punch. Hole puncher. Yeah. And a hole puncher. Yeah. So we will hole punch index cards, um, put the thread to, and that's where we titled all the metadata. So when um, we put the maps back in the boxes, we could see what we're looking at now. So we can see, oh, this is um, the Topeka, Kansas. This is Brown versus Board. So um, that was a very big step in organizing the maps. Um, that made it easier when me and Jalen had to go back 
to organize them again because it's a lot of organization. So this middle step really helped with um helped with the next stage. Um, it may have seen and it may seem repetitive, like we have we had to keep going back, keep cross checking. But when you have 944 maps, you want to make make sure everything is right. And me being I was on the maps first. I remember um, Jalen would come ask me a question like, hey, I think we have two 620s. Like, I think we have two of those. And I'm just like, oh my, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what we gonna do. But we made it through, so, um, I, and I realized how important it was to keep going back and to keep cross-checking everything because we wanted everything done to a T. That's why I'm so happy to hear that we only had 10 errors because when me and Lauren were first numbering the maps, we were so stressed. Like, if we left one day and we would leave a roll of maps on the on the table and we would come back the next day, we'll be like, what is this? Like, what is this laying right here? But that's why I'm so happy to hear that there wasn't that many errors when we, when we first did the work. Yeah, so at this point where they're up to now, and Shoma referenced the, the thread or the twine or whatever, um, we were able to finally get the maps kind of organized. So we're able to get them by case, and we're trying to figure out what's the best way to store these things, right? Because we the flat storage stuff is like really expensive, and we had our eyes on blueprint boxes. Um, but we had some funding that we could get that, and it was taking a while for the funding to come in. They keep talking about the boxes they were in. They were just big square boxes that just had rolls of maps in them. We, we kind of step up our box game here in a minute. We'll get to that in just a second. But these uh, they're just in these boxes. We get them wrapped um, we get them rolled up and then get them with the index cards by case and so we now we have the case written on the index card and the number of the maps that line up with the numbers on the back of the maps that line up with the spreadsheet that are starting to line up with this draft after draft of finding aids um, that we're working on so at this point um, once Jeremy and Jalen and Caroline are working together um, or I'm sorry Jeremy uh, and Jalen and Chom are working together we're kind of nearing the end but at the same time I keep finding more maps. Um, we will find a discrepancy here and there. Um, and as we've said, just you know, maybe 10 or a dozen or so. Um, so that work is happening now at the same time. Let's add another layer here. We have the documents to worry about. So I had been in the vault and I had seen the documents. Um, it was at 60 linear feet, correct? Yeah, so that's a lot of linear feet. And so that's for the entire collection. And I had kind of gone through the finding aid and we pulled what ended up being five, um, what's the measurement on the, the big boxes? Um, but you know, that's a box like this, right? Um, so. Um, the page card and box. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So five of those. And so now we have the daunting task of doing that. So that's when I get Jalen, I pull him upstairs. Uh, we have a workroom set up right across from my office that has our computers and scanners and everything like that in there. So I bring Jalen in. And I say, let's start scanning this stuff. Now, we got um, a lot of equipment from the Smithsonian, um, scanners and all this different stuff we needed, but it was kind of slow trickling in. So when we first started scanning over the summer, I started scanning the handwritten lamps and documents on a flatbed, uh, page by page. And the process we go by um, for digitization is you do, um, you want two files. You want a high def TIFF file and a little bit lower def JPEG file. The TIFF for your archive, the JPEG um, for the website or whatever. So so I'm um, scanning these, you know, page by page, the handwritten ones, and I'm like, well, I don't know if we really want to do what ends up being, like I said, over 12,000 pages of documents on flatbed scanners. Um, but I kind of started working on it over the summer before they came back. But before the end of the summer, we got our document feeder scanner in, and that was a super duper game changer there. Now we only have, now we have two. Right, I think it was like three days after we finished doing this part of the project, we got a second one in, like when our next shipment of stuff came in. Um, so we have one in a box right now, which we'll need when we do these other uh, however many linear feet of stuff. Um, but uh, for a, a minute there, I had um, uh, Jalen and Caroline working on scanning. Now Caroline had come in, and his, Caroline's been kind of our um, utility player here. Right now she's transcri transcribing oral histories that have been digitized, which she is just killing it at. Um, we got a 3D scanner. I put her on that for a couple weeks, and she's our computer person. She got to play around with that. But at first, I was like, we need you to scan. So I have Jalen scanning on the document feeder scanner. Caroline starts on the flatbed scanner. So 
So Caroline, uh, tell them what you thought about working with that single page scanner. Cause I remember you not being very happy about um, having to do that with the amount of documents that I had put in front of you. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> so I came in and um, they got two scanners. One of them is really slow and they gave me that one. And I figured, uh, <laughs> That's just because Jalen had more experience with scanning. I keep telling him to like put, him, put it in his resume because 12,000 uh, pages, that's a lot. But, uh, so I was scanning and I have to do these pages uh, twice, both um, JPEG and TIFF. And TIFF kind of um, take a lot of time. So um, I remember Chioma walking in on me and she was like, um, if it helps, you could just like watch movies while doing it. <laughs> and, that with that I was happy with, so I <laughs> <laughs> I ended up uh, taking my time, but uh, I'm glad that they have a new uh, scanner in now. <laughs> but yeah, that was my experience with it because computer science, I'll be like, I I thought you know, we sh it's a digital world. We should be having you know two two minutes, two seconds, you know, two seconds per page. But it took about five minutes per page, but. Still, I had my time with the movies, but it was good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, um, and like I said, we've definitely found more technological stuff for her to do. She was able to, I'll just brag on her a little bit, figure out the 3D scanner when it started uh, becoming time to transcribe um, oral histories that have been digitized. She's finding different um, AI interpreters to experiment with, different um, uh, like audio software to play in different configurations of sound and things like that. So we pulled her off the scanner very, very quickly because um, she didn't have a bad attitude about it, but um, uh, she likes to get stuff done quickly and this just was not happening for her with that. Um, Jalen, you got to use the good scanner um, with the document feeder. Do you want to talk just a little bit about your experience doing all those documents? Uh, sure, and I've used both of the scanners so I can definitely attest to that the slower one is definitely slower so uh, but yes we have to do and we're scanning these things more than once right we're doing a JPEG and a TIFF so the, the JPEG is going to take considerably less time but if you're using the slower scanner it's going to take considerably more time for the longer for the longer version but through that process it really it kind of just I was really on autopilot during the process because I can just feed these documents into the thing and they'll come back out and I can just make sure they line up with the metadata. I can make sure they are organized in the file explorer. But it was really just, and also with this, I never really got tired of it either because 12,000 pages, it really didn't feel like it. Because um, just, you know, reading, the, reading through the little, the little pages and having little conversations here and there about what I'm reading or what I see in a map or something like that, it's, it's very interesting to me, it's very fulfilling. And it really just enriched the experience further. Yeah, Jalen, you said something important there. We still had to consider metadata as we're doing this. Um, so we have the metadata for the documents, and these as the scans start coming through. And you know, he's doing the, during. You were usually there during the days, and since we had only had that one document feeder scanner, when he left, I would immediately go get that off of his desk and put it on my desk, so I could sit there for the afternoon and feed documents into it as well, because I just wanted to get this over with. And so between the two of us, we really were able to. But we both had to really be cognizant of the fact that um, we want to make sure all the numbers are lining up the way we had already done because before we do any scanning project no matter what it is I go create the metadata spreadsheets and create the numbering system and the same way with the maps it was a little bit less tedious but you still had to make sure that everything was lining up so part of what Jalen and I had to do and um, Jalen was really good at this was getting them done getting the numbering system done properly and double checking it all and then I check it and everything's good right so the document part was actually the easy part um, it wasn't as fun for some as it was for others, but that was, um, it gets us there. So by the time those are all done, the maps um, have been sent to our third party um, scanner, um, a local place here in Jackson in the Fonder neighborhood. Um, after some paperwork snafus and stuff, we did get all that back. So now we have digital files of all of these maps, the ones that we need. Um, but that leaves the last step here in the final organization, putting away of these maps and being done with them for a while. And so that's where uh, Jalen and Chioma really worked together. Chioma, when she came in, 
um, I guess in the fall, we, she worked on the maps a lot. We were trying to finish those up. And then our oral historian, Elisa Ray, I'm right here, give it up. Um, so she did uh, some great workshops with the students about transcribing oral histories. So we start moving people around. We got people transcribing oral histories, uh, people working on maps, people working on metadata and stuff like that. So by the very end, it comes to the, the very end and Chioma being the graduate fellow and my intentions to really help foster her as a leader and as a manager in her work um, is kind of, you know, overlooking all of this work. So she's kind of head of the map situation. She's aud um, audit editing the transcriptions before they go to Elisa Ray for final editing and approval. Um, so she's juggling a lot, but it comes down to the end of the maps, and I thought it would be apropos for her and Jalen to finish the maps together since they had worked on them so, uh, since the beginning. So... Uh, I guess uh, Chioma, we'll start with you. Um, just talk about that final push, and you know, thinking about the the good boxes that we got in, and also the the last of the finding aids that you guys created out of that. Okay, so they put me back on the box, uh, back on the maps, <laughs> um, but it was kind of a bittersweet ending because I knew this was the last really last step with getting them organized. So we had the blueprint boxes and me and Jalen and Dr. Lee helped also with this. Um, we had to figure out how to put them together because they came like, they, it was like an Ikea box. They We couldn't find the instructions, but we eventually got it together. <laughs> um, <laughs> we put the boxes together. They were just um, like a blueprint box, if you guys know. Um, they had little slots for the maps. So really, me and Jalen, they were really big because the maps are big. So me and Jalen were kind of struggling putting them together. It's really a two-person, like everything with the maps is a two-person job. Even so, putting the boxes together. Even yeah. putting the boxes together. So me and Jalen would go down, put the boxes together, and then we would just, and this was a really simple part because the maps were pretty much all the team effort they were pretty much organized and they were already rolled up so after we created the boxes we would just put the maps in the slots now with the finding aid um that i created we wanted to make sure that we have these boxes they were numbered like a1 through a3 we wanted to make sure someone could come in and just look at this finding aid and see a1 this is where brown versus board maps are so that's basically what I did. Um, so as I was putting the maps into the slots, I had to make sure I was also going to the finding aid and putting in where to actually find these maps. Um, and that was the end. That was it. Was it was um, really easy and it was kind of bittersweet because I was just like, after all, I've been working on the maps since January, and I think we f we finished with the maps completely. Uh, last month well it's only the first of march well second of march so we just finished with the maps but um it was it was really easy for the last step um to get those organized but it was also good to see um because coming in last january <laughs> the maps were just as we said in boxes unorganized you couldn't tell what's what and now going into the vault i can see them neatly to the side in these blueprint boxes and if i needed to go because the maps are amazing and i like i like to go look at them from time to time so if i need to go look at a certain map i know where the map is so that's how we ended our limps and map journey and uh, I will say my favorite part of this whole thing was when the boxes are being put together because they are fairly big. We finally did find the instructions, but to get to get it in the bottom, like Jalen would kind of have to crawl into the box yeah. a little bit to like reach to the bottom. Um, and I loved it so much uh, the yeah. first time I saw that happen. But that was really it. That was a great ending to the whole thing. So as it stands now, we have these blueprint boxes with the maps in them, perfectly lined up with our metadata and our finding aids. Um, we have six total blueprint boxes and one small box of some smaller and folded up maps that is all documented. And as uh, Choma said, um, about a 13 month process um, to get it all done with various people working on it at various stages, starting with uh, Ms. Stewart getting the collection in all the way up uh, to where we are now. So everybody give a ra big round of applause to the students one time, yeah. Um, so, uh, the last thing I want to talk about here is, as I mentioned way back in the beginning when I was doing introductions, um, a part, of, a big part of this whole thing is getting students the experience um, and the resources to have jobs in public history um, as historians or in any, any way that that would uh, shake out. Um, and as you've heard today, we have four students who are not only, um, you know, 
really good at the work that they do, but from a wide array of backgrounds, a wide array of majors and things like that, but also who have each shown a passion for this public history work, right? Like they found something in it um, that they like. So um, that's not just from working with these maps. We wanted to hone it in. Um, as you know, I'll mention now, we are working on, uh, I think, six or seven different collections to digitize overall for this big project that we're doing, several sets of oral histories, every Everything from scanning transcripts of old collections to digitizing uh, what we can digitize from old cassette tapes and transcribing that, um, document collections, a few artifacts and things like that. So we've all been doing all of this on top of just these maps as well. And at this point, we are completely digitized for what we owe the Smithsonian. Um, and we're just working on the final pieces of getting all that ready uh, to send off to them, which doesn't end our work. It just kind of starts uh, the next phase of it. But all that being said, I wanted to hear from the students one more time before we finish. Um, I'm going to kind of read this directly from what the HCAC got kind of goals are for the student workers. Um, it says, their experiences will demonstrate the ways that the HCAC is creating pathways to careers in public history for students at HBCUs from diverse academic backgrounds. I think you've already heard that today, probably, right? I'm um, just from the, the discussion or whatever. But I did want to go down the line and just let um, each student kind of talk about their overall general experience with this. Um, um, and more so, you know, not necessarily or we're putting them on the spot and say they have to be historians now, but anything that they could you that you guys have like learned from this work that you can apply to what you're doing, or if you do want to become a historian and be cool like the rest of us. Um, so, uh, Chioma, we'll start with you and you guys go on down the line and talk a little bit about that if you would. Um, I think my journey has been very telling, as was said earlier. I was a political science um, undergrad major, planning to go to planning to go to law school right after. Um, I graduated, but working as an undergrad with these maps and just in the Margaret Walker Center, I realized politics is just history. And um, just jumping into the museum field, I realized this is something I could see myself doing. And I really just um, owe it all to the Margaret Walker Center team because they were just so welcoming. I would really categorize this as my first real job, it feels like. Um, and I definitely um, feel like I've developed, like my like my mom would tell me like, oh my gosh, you're so big now. She would see me managing people, like she would call me boss lady. <laughs> but <laughs> I definitely feel like I owe it to the center. Um, they make it a place where you want to stay. Um, and I definitely feel like the HCHC goals are being hit. Um, just as I was an undergrad intern, um, and when I became a graduate fellow, I was given more tasks or I was given more responsibility. And that really feels good um, just to be, uh, know you're being seen in the team. Even I was given my own office. I was really happy about that. Like, I have my own office now. So um, I definitely love working with the Margaret Walker Center, um, and I'm so grateful for the HCHC team to have this opportunity out here for students. Um, even, like, to let more students know about the Margaret Walker Center. Because when I was an undergrad, sh shame on myself, but I did it. I never stepped into the Margaret Walker Center until my senior year. And I feel like that's such, um, that's like, it's such a shame on the Margaret Walker, um, Mar Margaret Walker's name, because she was such a great woman. And for me to find out so late, um, and even as I work as a hall director with freshman students, I really just try to get that, um, get her name out and let more people, more students know about the Margaret Walker Center and the great things that we're doing. Thanks. Jeremy? All right. Um, kind of similar to what um, Shoma said, I found a passion for the history upon actually like attending the Margaret Walker Center. Like, um, understanding different parts of history. Um, my particular favorite, of course, is um, the transcribing, of course. It's because not only are we transcribing things, we're transcribing things using the AAVA language, AAVE language, which I'm very passionate about when it comes to understanding black history. Um, I also gain more, like, understanding of our history, and it allows me to embed, it, embed up a lot of things into my writing. Um, I'm particularly interested in multiple things when it comes to black studies or black history in general, and Margaret Walker has introduced me to so much because of it, um, because of the interactions and stuff. I'm also happy with the um, interaction with um, coworkers of, of different backgrounds, of different ideals. Not only does, does that challenge me, but it, I also help in kind of like invoking or giving aid to their ideals. So 
I like the family atmosphere that we get at Mar- at the Margaret uh, Mar- uh, Mar- Walker Center, of course. You know, we can talk to some of our senior um, members, and they are very helpful, very comedic. It's it, it's like having actual like actually having a life. Like I have worked many jobs before, and this has been like one of my favorite. Mm-hmm. Out of all of them. Thank you, Jeremy. Caroline. Yeah, so for me, um, I'm also grateful for the family that we have at Magra Walker Center. I also, uh, during my undergraduate, I never stepped foot at the Magra Walker Center uh, <laughs> until the, uh, the graduate assistant's job was posted by, my, uh, by the um, computer science uh, dean. That's when I um, applied for it, and I, uh, fortunately I got it. And I'm, I'm so grateful um, for history can be um, for any discipline, like you know, even computer science. When I got there, I asked them, you know, what can I do because this is um, predominantly a historic place. But uh, that I've seen that I've, I can. There's something I can always do to help uh, in preservation of the history with the uh, 3D printer that I've been playing around with. <laughs> yeah, we can also, you know, uh, scan some uh, artifacts and, you know, preserve them that way and, you know, print them uh, 3D so, you know, th- that can be used, then preserve the original version of it, as well as the uh, transcribing, playing around with the uh, foot uh, thing. <laughs> yeah, the foot, foot pedal. pedal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, while we transcribe, I also, I uh, get to learn a lot from the, because that's like uh, oral interviews. So I, I have learned a lot uh, from all the projects that we've done, and I'm so grateful for that. Thank you, Caroline. Jalen? Um, let me prime this by saying that I am a, a business major, and with business major in the College of Business is always looking forward, thinking strategically, fast, fast, fast lifestyle, career fairs every month almost. But in my experience with the Margaret Walker Center, I've I've learned the importance of looking backwards. And history has always been a passion to me, but upon, I'll say even in the start in spring 22, just being in the vault, dealing with the maps and stuff like that, it became, as I said, readily apparent that I was doing important work. And I was doing work that needed to be done. So every day I come into work, I feel like I'm doing something purposeful. And even though business, I wouldn't say it relates that much to the area of history, being in the environment, uh, having a job in the history is, is giving me a much better experience in the business world because I'm, I'm very adaptable now because we're doing so many different projects. We're transcribing and scanning and organizing and it just helps me feel like a better well-rounded individual. Yeah. Excellent, thank you guys so much. Um, I just appreciate the work. Yeah, let's give it up for the students one time. Um, you know, I'm kind of let Miss Stewart get the last word in here about um, everything that we've been doing. But the overall goal of you know, at, you know, offering access to these kind of jobs and these kind of experiences, um, I just can't say enough about the four students who we've been lucky enough um, to work with. Um, you, you know, Jalen knows that as long as he's an undergrad, he's our undergrad intern if he wants it. Um, and shout out to the Smithsonian, they pay really well, so I don't see him going anywhere, even if we bring you more maps, you know what I'm saying? Um, and Chioma, she's got another uh, full, ac- after this semester, another full academic year. What I haven't said yet also is that the Smithsonian, um, we have funding for if Chioma, after she's done with her master's, um, funding for two more years working a full-time position at Margaret Walker, which will not only give her all this undergrad and grad experience, but also two full years um, employment. That's for every grad fellow we ever have. Um, so we're talking careers here, right? Um, so, um, Ms. Stewart, do you want to say anything else, just last words about the Lampson Collection? Then I'm going to come back real quick and do some shameless plugs, and then we'll uh, leave, leave you guys alone. First, I want everybody to again give all of our students a round of applause. Every December, I come into this space to help celebrate Kwanzaa. Kumba is the principle of creativity, and it means leaving your world better than you found it. And these people, they have definitely done that. They have left the Margaret Walker Center much better than they found it, especially in terms of the map collection. Also, I want to say that 
I had the opportunity to talk to Jalen's dad, and he was so appreciative because he said, you all have brought so much out of Jalen. We already knew he had all these gifts, but the way you all have brought this out. So it made me feel good to hear a parent who's not there every day seeing, saying he sees something in his son that has come out of working at the Margaret Walker Center. So. Um, that just made my heart feel good. In the, the Lamson Collection, I've actually had the opportunity to share with a researcher from the documents. She was looking for a document, couldn't find it anywhere else, and she said, the only place I've seen that has it is the Margaret Walker Center, and we did, and I was able to scan it and get it to her. I could do that with the documents. Now, if anybody wants to come through the maps, we have that same capacity to do that with the maps. So yes, we're entirely grateful for that. I also though want to, our staff is here and I want to point out our oral historian has been mentioned about transcriptions and Elisa Ray Funderburg is our Mellon Foundation sponsored oral historian. Patrice Jones, who makes everything run at the Margaret Walker Center. She's our administrative assistant and building administrator, but really, she's the wind beneath our wings. <laughs> she <laughs> makes sure we have what we need to yeah. get everything up. And then Christina Thomas just started this week as our Mellon Scholar, already jumping in, helping out with projects, and she's gonna be a wonderful addition to us for the next two and a half years, so. Yeah. <laughs> and, I also want to mention our director who's not here. He's in Washington, D.C., Dr. Robert Luckett, because um, a lot of this was the, his vision of what we needed to be doing going forward at the Margaret Walker Center. Yeah, when I was a grad assistant there in 2010 and 11, um, it, the staff was Ms. Stewart, Dr. Luckett, and an administrative assistant, a bunch of, like a ragtag group of graduate assistants. But we were able to, we had grants um, and funding from the Ford Foundation and NEH to do Margaret Walker's personal papers, of which we did thousands of pages of and have a full digital collection of that that is finished. And let me give you an example. Margaret Walker, we digitized 35,000 pages for her collection. And the Lampson collection alone, how many pages? Topeka's just 12,000. Just so, Topeka's yeah. 12,000. <laughs> yeah. um, so we had experience doing this. Um, I want to open up for questions, but real quick, I wanted to say um, one thing I haven't mentioned today is not only are we the Margaret Walker Center, we also run and coordinate the COFO Center, which is right off campus, Council of Federated Organizations building. That is on um, you guys' schedule for tomorrow for tour time. I'm going to be in there from 2 to 4. Um, Whenever, if you guys want to make that part of your stop, come by. I, um, my favorite part of my job is getting to do uh, COFO tours and talk about COFO and stuff. So we'd love to have you guys over there. Also, if you check our website, we have our Case Festival, which is basically our student-driven um, panels and conference um, creative arts festival, April 14th and 15th. And the big thing we're working on, um, November 1st through 4th of this year, is the Phyllis Wheatley Poetry Festival 50th anniversary. In 1973, Margaret. Walker brought some of the top black uh, women writers to Jackson, Audre Lorde, Alice Walker, all kinds of people, and we're doing the 50th anniversary reconvening this year. Um, there's uh, nine of the writers are still alive, and I think seven of them are going to be here in conversation with current black female voices who, you know, writers. Um, we're going to have all this um, whole host of events and stuff. We are in the mega planning phase of that right now. It's a whole university-wide effort. Um, with the committees and everything. So that's the big thing that we're pushing for toward the end of the year. So please check us out on all the shameless plug time, show, social media stuff, the website, we do stuff all the time, all kinds of programming um, that I think you guys and everyone would find very interesting, um, just really centered around the black experience in the South as Margaret Walker's original vision was um, for the center. So one more time, give it up for everyone. Thank you so much. Um, and I would like to um, open it up if anyone has any questions. Chris is walking around with the microphone and he will come find you. Oh, made it easy on you there. <laughs> First, 
Hello, thank you guys so much for this amazing work. Um, I just wanted to know, I'm a, I'm a historian at Southern Miss, and I was wondering, now that you've been in the documents, you've been in with the maps, what do you guys think researchers might want to do with these maps or these papers, but especially the maps? Like, what do you envision someone could do with these things? Anyone of you guys got anything? Jeremy will. Um, thank you for your question. I think in the terms of like law, from my understanding, for um, if something was to be passed, if um, if it, if it was already passed previously, we can they can actually come to the archives and actually pull these argument, pull these um, maps up and use it as a um, element of support um, for their argument. Or like for people like me, I'm a writer. So particularly when I, um, before I do any particular form of writing, I particularly look in history, look at archives and stuff. And that sparks creativity for me. And so I can write about these particular things. Um, and I think for, that's from my understanding. I think that's about it from my perspective. Yeah. Um, something I could definitely see some um, researchers using the maps for. Um, I know when you think of these cases like Brown versus Bohr and these major um, these um, redlining cases, I know me personally, I never thought of these underground people. Like, of course, you need a map maker because you need to know, um, check how these lines are being drawn, how these lines are being changed. So I think a researcher looking at these maps and seeing how Lampson physically went in on all these, he has copies of the same map, um, let's say different time periods, and you can visually see how these neighborhoods are changing over time. So I definitely definitely think if a researcher wants to know how, how, how what was it like in court trying to prove these arguments and prove these cases and what techniques were being used, you can definitely use the maps for that. And I, and I just wanted to mention, in terms of the documents, they're very historical. William Lamson was meticulous in researching the history of whatever area he was researching. So whether it was the Brown versus the Board of Education case, where he go, would go back all the way to the 1930s and 40s, looking at Topeka and Shawnee County, Kansas demographics, but also he wrote dissertation length documents documenting what all of this information meant. So it's not just numbers or pictures, but it's actual interpretation, at least his interpretation, for court what these statistics meant. And so it gives you a real sense of that, and then when you if you're a visual learner and you can pair the map with the words, that is a powerful thing to be able to see, you know, how Shawnee County looked. That's the county where Topeka is located. And what it meant to have open enrollment versus school district lines. And extrapolate that to other schools and who are having issues with desegregation. Because he not only did desegregation in terms of cases such as Brown, he also worked in Michigan, his home state, but he also worked for the Department of Justice in federal decree cases. Oftentimes when the court would say, you have to do this, local communities would say, no, we don't. Mm -hmm. And so he would have to go in and document what they weren't doing in terms of what the court had ordered them to do. So you get all of that information as well. And not just for um, education, but voting rights, even down to um, need assessments for hospitals and communities. And, it, and that's another thing you see, the variety of work a person who's a demographer could do. You know, it's not just doing maps or analyzing people, but looking at the needs and communities and being able to communicate with local communities, organizations, and the federal government, which all come together to put in these cases. Yeah, and if I will say the 
data that exists within this paperwork, um, especially his spreadsheets and stuff. The reason that a county like Shawnee or a city like Topeka didn't think they needed to fix things is because the data didn't exist that showed that they needed to because they're not creating the data that shows that they need to. So this ACLU expert has to come in and create all that data. So if anybody wants to go back and do a retrospective, these boxes and what we've digitized might be one of the only places that actually um, quantifiably shows that um, that it needed to be done, right? And that the, the data might just exist there, or at least it's a very big part of that data. One other thing I say, I, always, I wouldn't want to write a book about it at some point um, called What It Really Takes, because we think of like Brown, like in, in 1954, and it was like, oh yeah, the Supreme Court finally did the right thing and got rid of separate but equal, right? And it's like, oh, sure, that's simple, right? But it took years and years of litigation and working through the courts and even just this one, this one expert witness just on this Topeka case that he worked on for you know this, the 11 years that he worked on it, it took him all of this just to answer a very simple question. We didn't actually desegregate our schools properly. Maybe we should build some uh, other schools to get some of these, uh, you know, some of these schools desegregated or whatever. And it took all of that to answer a very simple common sense question. So I'm always fascinated with that in history of the idea of what did it really take for these things to happen. And I think this case is a, that one case is a very good example um, of that. Thank you for the question. Uh, I have a question. Wait, so hold on one second, what'd you say? Oh yeah, they are. They're very <laughs> aesthetically pleasing. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Um, can you tell from the maps of what cases they were used in, and if any notable, such as Thurgood Marshall or Constance Baker Miley, or any others that used the information, and what maybe what judges used them for their opinions? Okay, for example, with the Topeka case, he's actually working on Brown Three. So by 79, 82, um, Thurgood Marshall is no longer um, doing that. So what he's looking at is with the ACLU and the leadership of the ACLU and the leadership of Topeka, Kansas, because the argument is that children should be able to go to school wherever parents want to send them to school. That's the idea behind open enrollment. What the leaders of the ACLU and the concerned parents were noticing is that it was resegregating because people were ending up in these various, in their self-chosen schools. But yeah, with certain cases, you know from the case law who actually used the information. You know from his notes, because he had to produce memos and he had to submit travel vouchers and um, documentation to whoever was lead on the case. Um, so you know that way who in terms of the legal. And, and in most of these documents, they may start, most of his work was in the federal system. So they may start in the district court. Some of the cases went all the way to the Supreme Court. So you see that pathway from you know, the district level all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And I will say, as part of what we're doing, it's the digitization project, but also we're creating this website that's not just a online archive, I mean, it's part that, but it's also putting these five HBCUs in conversation with each other. And so part of our job over the next three and a half years of this project is to dig into this research more and find those very interesting type things, right? So we know they're there, we've seen some examples of them, but we're gonna find those, and that's what's gonna be presented to the public to say, uh, like attention grabber, to say, check out you know, what we have archived behind here, right? So finding those big names justices and things like that and I think ultimately that's why we decided to pick uh, Topeka as our first case um, to do because it's got that brown three name recognition to it but that's a great question and the next part of our process is researching to present the best public facing um, product that we can as we get ready to do that part of it well you just answered part of my question which was whether or not you're going to develop a website make all of this accessible. But I'm also wondering with the Smithsonian connection, will the images and the documents themselves be available through the Smithsonian website as well? 
Yeah, so what's going to happen is we're creating this HCAC project um, that we're initially working on, and it's not you know us giving up everything to them. They're going to create this website, host everything for us, but we also retain the rights to everything. So when this five-year project that started in the beginning of 2021 is over, we'll have all of our stuff, and we'll create our own um, websites. They'll always host this project um, of these five HBCUs, but then um, on top of our Margaret Walker digital collection, and we will be able to add to um, everything else. And so the funding was to create this as part of their mission, but also to further these, eight, or these schools' mission to have their own uh, websites, which we have one for the Margaret Walker stuff, but I don't think the other HBCUs have n nearly anything as extensive as we already did. So um, the other thing is we're considered the pilot program. They want to continue this and add five HBCUs on every five-year rotation. So um, not only adding to what the Smithsonian is hosting, which gets our name even further out there, but it trickles back down to um, what we are all getting to host locally. We just uh, sent our, we bought servers to all this, sent them to IT, they're getting our servers hooked up for our storage and for eventually disseminating the information out on our own um, when it's time. So it will be a couple layers of like public um, online presentation. Yeah. That's had a two part question. So how did you all get the project, the, the William Nelson material? And then the second question is, did you find maps that are Mississippi related? You want to do that? Yes. There are. He worked on a case in Hattiesburg. He worked on cases in Jackson, Mississippi. So, yes, there are Mississippi. But, that, but to me, the bigger thing I learned is that desegregation is not just a Southern thing. He worked on cases in Las Vegas, Clark County. He worked on cases in San Francisco. He worked on cases in Boston dealing with desegregation. So you quickly learned that it's not even just a subject. But yes, there are cases that deal with. Um, because even though Brown said desegregation in 54, and then you had all deliberate speed in 55, most public schools weren't desegregated to 1970. And then there are some districts that were able to put that off until the 1990s, 2000s. So, so, you know, place, because of the way they geographically geomandered African Americans out of the city limits. So technically, if they don't live in the city, you're not, you know, you're not segregated. You, they just don't live in the city. So, and that's why these cases keep coming up because you, they realize that people were doing a lot of in rounds around so whether it's in Mississippi and Hattiesburg or in Jackson or it's out in Las Vegas or in Maricopa County in Arizona, you know, there, there are, you find out there are a lot of places that have similar issues to what people usually just characterize as being Southern issues. But. Um, and as far as Mississippi maps, I will say um, the majority of what we do have, uh, Jackson stuff and Vicksburg stuff, um, dealing with what you were talking about earlier, um, hospital things. So like community needs things for like uh, areas that need um, hospitals and that don't have hospitals or whatever. So um, a lot of those kind of community needs based kind of things that was going on um, in Mississippi at the time. Um, maybe one time for one more um, and we'll... <laughs> Give it to our oral historian. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. You, oh, you ask about how did we acquire the Lamson stuff initially, Ms. Stewart? You'd... Yeah, from Lee Lamson Quay, his daughter, and um, his widow, Karen Quay, is who we, re who we received the material from. Yeah, he donated it directly to the center. He or, did. He didn't. He they was did. deceased. Yeah, he was deceased, but they did. As yeah. his survivors, yeah, they his survivors donated did. it to the center. So the actual rights fall with Jackson State or with the Smithsonian? Oh, that's They us. fall with yeah. us. Yeah. You didn't have to give up um, any Karen rights to them. and Lee signed a contract of donation with the Margaret Walker Center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi. So I have a question for the students. Um, I'm curious if working with these historical documents has had any impact on the way you think about politics today. Just like Ms. Stewart said, desegregation is a long-standing issue. So do you it change the way you think or impact anything you're seeing in, in the world now? Um, 
Yes, definitely. I can attest to that because, as I said before, I I like I like history, but I always wasn't in the the feeling of looking back all the time. But as you look back, it's easier to look forward too. So as I look back, I can see the trends, or maybe I can see you know something new that's that looks like the old, and it it helps me to, I guess, live smarter and know more about the things that are happening as I live. So yeah, that's what I can say. Also, the maps and the redistricting, it's, uh, you know, as a strategy, a political strategy, that was really smart. And the maps kind of, like, prove that point. So for me, um, as a English major, um, you know, of course, English and history go a long way. And from, like, understanding these particular things, we... Um, these particular um, things of inhuman um, actions, we can connect them to the present. Like certain things that are going on in the present, they have already been redone before. The acts of segregation um, currently is going on right now with the House 1020 bill. And so it speaks to mind of like the importance of history and the importance of learning history. Because the thing about it is, you know, accurate history, not the sense of washing history away. Because if we do not um, talk about or discuss the uncomfortable truths, we can never get past or solve the solutions of today's problems. And so for me, looking at these maps, understanding these particular things set me up to understand like when I go out there and when I do particular things, I'm trying to progressively move forward so then we don't have to worry about the things of the past. Um, I know I can say really quick, um, I didn't go to school. I'm not from Mississippi. I'm from Georgia. But definitely, as everybody else said, we're recognizing patterns. And me being a pol um, political science undergrad major, um, just looking at these maps, seeing the census records he put, um, like blacks, like where blacks went to school and where whites went to school, and like circle is, um, history is a goes in a circle and you can see it happening over and over again because I can know like from when I was in high school I went to like predominantly black high school and just the way um housing districts were drawn in my community um like the town over Fayetteville which is predominantly white it's real hard for blacks to get along with the bank to live over there so you realize and that's a predominantly white area and you real you start to see that pattern like with redlining and you think you really do think it's over but it's really not it still happens to this day um and you know I hope change is being made it's a process but looking at these maps I realized like this this is my school district like even though they're they're not in these maps are not from Georgia it may be in um Topeka Kansas or Arizona I'm looking at it, and I'm like, this looks exactly like how I grew up and where I went to school. So definitely, I recognize that pattern. All right, we want to thank everyone for hanging out with us today. Um, give it up one time, especially for the students. Come see us at the Margaret Walker Center and at COFO. Um, and thanks, uh, the museums and MDAH, for having us here. Another great event. Thanks, guys.